Hello everyone, I'm Andrew Wilson, Professor of Ukrainian Studies at University College London, where I've been teaching a course since the 1990s called The Making of Modern Ukraine. But in this series of short, easily digestible lectures, we'll be talking mainly about Russia's war against Ukraine, explaining why it happened, how it's unfolding, and what's at stake. First four lectures were mainly about Russia, followed by four lectures about Ukraine. In order to talk about Russia, we're going to start in a strange place uh, by talking about what Russians call political technologies. That's not a familiar phrase in the West, but it's very familiar to Russians and indeed Ukrainians. Political technologies, this cartoon shows, are a formidable set of instruments for manipulating politics. This is Aunt Elizabeth from the TV series The Great. Her definition of political manipulation is roll the dice rather than rig the game first. That's bad politics. So this is fiction, but arguably there is a tradition of political manipulation in Russia. Uh, going back to the imperial period when the secret police, the Akrana, was notorious for disinformation, creating the infamous forgery, the Protocols of the El Elders of Zion, creating pro-regime uh, police parties, as they were called. And then in the Soviet period, um, there wasn't much politics at home to manipulate, uh, but there was plenty of manipulation abroad by KGB um, uh, during the Cold War. And therefore, when politics normal politics returned to the Soviet Union, Russia, in the late Gorbachev era, there was manipulation from the very beginning. Many of the people in the Communist Party were not natural Democrats. There has been no real democratic transfer of power, either from the Soviet Union to Russia or within independent Russia since 1991. One political technologist, so-called in Russia, Gleb Pavlovsky, has made the following claim. Don't bother looking at the kind of formal chronology of elections uh, and political events. What really matters, the real source of change in Russia was not political programs, but political technologies in Russia, which have adapted since the kind of early beginning where particular things were manipulated um, to become a much more organized and comprehensive system of manipulation. So in Russia, you have political technology firms. Uh, this bottom one is Gleb Pavlovsky's uh, organization, which is called the Foundation for Effective Politics. If you're, if you're interested, it's actually named after the foundation in Asimov's uh, science fiction series, uh, uh, a kind of secretive organization which preserves the empire via their kind of pseudo-scientific knowledge, which is exactly what these guys saw themselves as doing. Another company actually called itself Nikola M, Russia's first PR company, actually advertising the fact that it's selling Machiavellian manipulation and here are some of these individual political technologists. This is Gleb Pavlovsky up there. Um, not all of them are Russian. This is um, uh, a Ukrainian guy uh, who they often work with, uh, responsible for manipulative opinion polls um, up to and including the 2022 invasion. Uh, and eventually, these guys moved into and took over the Kremlin uh, most notoriously, a guy called Vladislav Surkov, who uh, oversaw everything, who defended the Kremlin from political challenges, who had a kind of finger in every aspect of politics. So political technology starts off by manipulating individual parties or politicians. Uh, this is Vladimir Zhirinovsky, the original invented fake opposition, who had a long career eventually working with Putin uh, as well. 
This is a notorious election in 1996. Uh, Boris Yeltsin, at the start of the year, was extremely unpopular. His rating was in single figures. He ends up winning, uh, albeit only in the second round. Um, and the key is the third candidate, Alexander Lebed, who is covertly supported by people, the same kind of people who are financing Yeltsin, uh, as what Russians call a relay runner. So he wins 14.7% of the vote, hands over his votes to Yeltsin in the second round. This scenario was so popular that the, the very same people repeated it in Ukraine three years later, 1999. The equivalent of Boris Yeltsin, an unpopular incumbent, was Leonid Kushma. So the key candidate running the relay race in Ukraine is called Yevhen Marchuk. So his 8.5% of the vote transfers to uh, Kushma to win in the second round. So what starts with kind of manipulating individual politicians eventually becomes an ability to manipulate the entire political system to create what I would call virtual political geography. Uh, you shape the entire political system. You create a fake opposition. You split the opposition. Um, you create a kind of fake third force. All of those strategies are possible. So this is well known. It happens throughout the former Soviet Union. So this is the beginning of Volodymyr Zelensky's TV show, Servants of the People. Uh, he's a school teacher, and he rants against uh, how politics works in Ukraine. So he's actually criticizing political technology and artificial polarization of politics. He says, there's no one to choose. We're choosing between two bastards. It's been like this for 25 years. Nothing will change this time. Do you know why? It's because you, my father, and me will choose a bastard again. It's because, yes, he's a bastard, but he's still better than all the other ones. So he becomes infamous, a school teacher, by telling the truth, by ranting against the way in which people are persuaded uh, to back an unpopular incumbent because he's better than a kind of artificially created worse alternative. So as the system develops, all politics becomes controlled. All parties in the Russian system, uh, not just the ruling party United Russia, but a whole caste list of supposedly left-wing, supposedly right-wing, supposedly populist parties. And by time of the most recent elections, which for president were uh, in 2018, Russia is manipulating even the very idea of opposition. In this candidate, you have Zenia Sobchak, who is supposed to be uh, a liberal uh, standing against Vladimir Putin. But her father uh, was Putin's mentor when he was uh, governor of St. Petersburg. So this is highly suspicious. Zenia Sobchak ends up fleeing the country because she made critical remarks about the 2022 war against Ukraine. Um, but the point here is people did, just didn't know. They couldn't tell whether she was really opposing Putin or not. And this is kind of mature political technology, as well as controlling the entire political system, you control its boundaries. So it's not clear where real politics and virtual politics end. Last parliamentary elections, uh, again, you had the same old, same old list of Kremlin parties uh, purporting to cover the entire political spectrum. This time, there was demand for new faces, for new people. So the Kremlin faked that as well. And you had one new party thrown into the mix. So the system matures. It becomes a way of manipulating uh, all politics, rather than just elements in politics. Key to that is control of the media. Uh, 
particularly since 2012, uh, when there were protests against one particular rig rigged election. Social media, too. A rise of the characteristic Russian media technology of trolling. There may be some genuine independent voices still out there on social media, so you troll them uh, from the government. In mainstream media, you have a whole set of technologies to sell propagandistic ideas. What Russian called, Russians call toilet pipes for spewing out disinformation. Individuals can be toilet pipes or so-called tele-killers, the notorious propagandists of state TV. A whole universe now of sophisticated propaganda and propaganda technologies. Fake events in Ukraine, fake Ukrainians on Russian TV, often fighting each other. What Russians call dramaturgia, a kind of artificial scripted drama that is created by political technologists um, to drive victory in a particular election or to justify something like a military campaign. There's this fantastically vague slogan in the 2007-2008 elections. Plan Putin. Putin's plan. Dot, dot, dot. Whatever Putin's plan is, um, the population should, should support it. Driving Putin's popularity rating is key to the system and the dramaturgia that drives the system. Uh, it never falls that low, but it needs to be quite high, 70, 80 percent, so that most people buy the kind of official propaganda line. So when it's been falling, it's been falling dangerously low to 60 percent. Uh, the key events like the annexation of Crimea, 2014, uh, the um, current war 2022 drive his popularity back up again and it works uh, you can see for example Russians attitudes towards Ukrainians how they used to be blue line pretty positive red line negative pretty low apart from briefly during the 2008 war against Georgia but how since 2014 you've driven that into negative territory um, through state propaganda. This much more complicated graph, and that's the point, shows a kind of churn of enemies, how you can create hostility towards Georgians, Ukrainians, uh, Americans, Europeans, uh, depending on what the current political needs are. The weaponization of fear. This is the kind of uh, thing that you can see on Russian TV, boasting about how quickly uh, Russian nuclear missiles can hit Western cities like London or Berlin or Paris. Having controlled politics, political t technology has spread to other spheres as well. In the noughties, you had a series of what were called coloured revolutions in Ukraine in 2004, in Georgia in 2003. So the political technologists develop what they call counter-revolutionary technology, ways of stopping that happening in Russia too. If these kind of protests were driven by youth groups, Russia set up pro-Kremlin youth groups uh, like Nashi or ours. Uh, if the problem was demonstrators on the streets calling for change, uh, then you set up pro-government demonstrations. In Russian, these are called pro-Putin meetings. Meeting is meeting. Meetingi, plural. So Putingi means pro-Putin meetings. Uh, fake election observers. This is Nashi, the kind of pro-Kremlin youth group. Uh, this is a kind of typical election observer not noticing, uh, not, not being very observant at all. This is a kind of Austrian MEP 
during the so-called referendum uh, in the Donbass in East Ukraine in 2014, he's being asked, is there a problem with holding, holding a vote when uh, there's a war going on, when there are armed soldiers everywhere? And he says no, uh, even though you can clearly see one in the background. As well as faking politics, you faked Russia moved into faking civil society. Uh, instead of NGOs, non-government organizations, you increasingly have gongos, government-organized, non-government organizations. Particularly since 2012, you have political technology and political technologists moving into history as well. Huge amounts of gongo, government resources, poured into um, patriotic history societies uh, and using the same kind of propaganda methods to sell a manipulated view of history. Vladimir Vidinsky, Putin's court historian, is tellingly not historian. He's a former political technologist. Um, uh, that was his first job in the 90s. Then he was an MP. Uh, and rather crazily, he's been put in charge of, or was in charge of, early negotiations, which didn't go anywhere, um, uh, with Ukraine during the early phases of the 2022 war. This is a massive insult to the Ukrainians to appoint someone who thinks Ukraine doesn't exist, uh, but it's characteristic of how the Russian system works that someone like that would be in charge of negotiations. His big pro project was inventing uh, a history about the 28 men of Panfilov. Um, that's what this means in Russian. A historical myth about heroic defense of Moscow from the Germans in December 1941. The Soviet authorities basically knew that this didn't happen, that most of it was made up and exaggerated. Medinsky, however, didn't care. This is a sacred le legend, he says, uh, that you just can't touch or deny. The legend is more important than the facts. And he has pumped resources into films, monuments, uh, about this subject. This is Putin and former Kazakh President Nazarbayev watching that film. Don't look particularly excited. Increasingly, political technology abroad, trying to promote Russian influence and Russian propaganda and Russian propagandized views of history, uh, politics, geopolitics, uh, through media organizations, front groups, gongos abroad, co-opting, co bribing politicians in other countries uh, to follow the Russian line. One example. Uh, Georgia, as a post-Soviet country, has basically been Russified. Um, it used to be famous as being one of the most democratic post-Soviet states. But it now deploys all of these technologies uh, to disguise and uh, allow the oligarchization of power by one individual. Big oligarch, local oligarch, called Bidzina Ivanishvili. So using these same techniques of propaganda, proxies, um, and in the Georgian, Georgian case, a bit of outright thuggery, so-called zondarebi, to beat up uh, uh, anti-government protesters. This is even East Philly, the, the big oligarch, and this is kind of Bond villain style lair above the capital, Tbilisi. Political technology created the kind of propaganda that drove uh, the first war against Ukraine in 2014. Again, artificial pro-Putin, pro-Russian meetings, often physically staffed by what we call special tourists, spetsturisti, Russians from Russia, pretending to be uh, local supporters of Russia in Ukraine. And a kind of big lie, propaganda, the way in which um, 
lies about Ukrainians being Nazis, uh, about Ukrainians, it, this is an actor claiming that Ukrainians crucified children. Uh, this is Donetsk, key city in East Ukraine, photoshopped to appear to be on fire under attack by Ukrainian forces. This never happened. Russia's big lie, propaganda. Now in later classes we're going to talk about how um, that kind of propaganda has, has metastasized uh, and been key to the war in 2022. This is full-on war. It's not so much political technology in itself. We've in some ways gone beyond that, but Russia still uses the same techniques of manipulation and propaganda to disguise what it's doing. So that's the setup. Russia is a political technology propaganda state. So I've talked about that first because that explains everything else that Russia does and does selectively. The way that Russia talks about empire and relates to historical traditions of empire is highly selective, propagandistic um, and uh, political technology based. Even the extent to which Russia is a fascist state comes from political technology and this kind of postmodern selective reading of and use of historical elements. Pastiche, uh, bricolage, uh, that kind of thing. So next class we'll talk about how Russia relates to empire and then after that how Russia relates to fascism. And finally, fourth lecture about Russia, Russia and geopolitics. <laughs>